Hey everybody, it's John Weecroft here, bringing you another Sunday Q&A session. We're up to week number 33, and it's the first one in 2021. So I'd like to take this opportunity to wish you a happy new year. I hope you had a great Christmas, and I hope that the new year is a prosperous one. I hope it's a good year for you, uh, for everyone. Plenty of great stuff this week. So thanks once again for the questions and the suggestions. The tune is the evergreen standard, Sunny. So I'm gonna do my usual three takes and pick the best one. Uh, what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna look a little bit into practice um, methods, how you might drill one of these standards and the kind of things that I do in preparation for doing these recordings. I'm kind of gonna do it a bit backwards actually. I'll play the tune first and then I'll break it down into what I would do to practice it. Um, and what I did yesterday, I did 10 different approaches against the same backing track. I always make my own backing tracks as well, which is another way of reinforcing learning the tune because not only do I need to know what the lead guitar is playing, I also need to know what the bass line is and I also know, need to know what the rhythm guitar is going to do. So I'd really urge you to start generating your own practice material. You know, it doesn't have to be anything super sophisticated. It could literally just be playing the chords into your phone. You know, I used to use a cassette tape recorder for years, you know, and now I've gone all high tech and I use you know, an iPhone or what have you. Or occasionally for these things, you know, I put it into, uh, into my computer and record them in Logic. But for practice purposes, it could just be something really simple. <laughs> Thank you. 
question from Andy, following on from the material we looked at last week, where I looked at playing through a blues progression in every area of the neck, choosing each uh, sort of landmark area based around the octaves. Uh, so Andy was asking if I could go into other approaches that you might use when learning a tune. So I thought I'd use the piece that I've just played as a way of demonstrating some of the things that I do when I practice. So in fact, I did this very thing last night in preparation for recording today. I went through this tune, Sonny, uh, of which I made a backing track. Uh, the backing track's four minutes long. Uh, and I figured that's kind of like long enough to get significant work done, but not so long that you start drifting, if that makes sense. So what I did is I played through the backing track 10 times. And each of the 10 times I uh, adopted a completely different approach or at least a developed approach. So rather than just putting the backing track on and just playing through it sort of with no real sort of sense of plan or purpose, uh, every time for each of the 10, I had a really specific goal in mind. So these are by no means uh, the only things that you can do, but I'm gonna go through those 10 approaches for you now, uh, just by way of illustrating just some of the possibilities, of course, you could go through this you know, endless amount of times and keep finding new things to say. But for now, let's look at the 10. So we'll start, the first thing that I did is I played through the whole backing track, the entire duration of it, and just played the melody. Very, very sort of uh, simply, kind of as, uh, uh, as clearly as I can with little in the way of embellishments. So that's where we'll begin. you can play the melody in different octaves in different areas of the neck and throughout the kind of six or seven choruses you'll get opportunity to try that in different locations of course so just for the sake of brevity I'm just gonna record uh, one chorus of each idea okay okay so then the next thing to do will be to play the melody and maybe play some fills in between some little embellishments to the melody or you could perhaps play it using devices like octaves so that's the next thing that we're gonna do I'm gonna embellish the melody I think in this instance I'm gonna play octaves <laughs> thing I'm going to do is play a bass line. Now of course there's already a bass line on the track so it's going to sound maybe a little bit unusual but it's a really good exercise in terms of outlining the harmony. So being able to play the bass line of the piece that you're about to play or the piece that you're learning is a really good way of reinforcing the chord changes. So that's going to be our next thing, bass line. <laughs> I'm just going to play the blues throughout the entire tune. So in this instance, I'm going to choose A minor blues scale, which works against all the changes. In fact, the melody line is exclusively pentatonic scale. So this is going to work, but I'm going to try and sort of keep away from the melody, if that makes sense. Um, but I'm going to stick to the blues scale and try and make it fit against all the chords just by picking the notes, hopefully picking nice notes against each of the chord changes. <laughs> run through I'm going to outline the harmony by using some small triadic ideas. Thank you. 
Let's pause there at the midway point. That's five different approaches. So we started off with number one was the melody. The second one was to play the melody line with some embellishments. I think in this instance that shows octaves. But throughout the course of the whole four minute backing track, I can explore a whole range of different ideas. Okay, the third one then was to play through using the bass line, playing a bass line. And the fourth one was to play through the tune, but just using the blue scale, in this case the A minor blue scale for the whole tune. Uh, approach number five was to use the triads from the, uh, the underlying harmony, so that means you really need to know the chord progression. Now remember, of course, all I'm showing here is just one chorus for each of those approaches. But in actual fact, what I've been doing is playing through the whole tune each time and just picking the best one out of them. So I'm 20 minutes into practicing this tune already. So I'm kind of like using a practice routine and I'm playing through it using the full duration to show you the kind of thing that I might do in preparation for learning any tune. So we'll continue now with the remaining five approaches. It's really important that you know the harmony over which you're playing. So the next approach we're going to take is to play the rhythm guitar. So in this instance, as there's already a rhythm guitar on the track, I'm going to avoid the lower strings and voice my chords on the top four. and sevenths form a really active connection between the harmony when you move through a chord progression. So it's a really good idea that you can isolate these really crucial specific intervals. In this instance I'm going to do so on the strings three and four, so the middle of the guitar. I'm just going to play the third and seventh for each chord. Of course when practicing through the respective choruses I might move this to strings one and two and strings five and six. So the next one, thirds and sevenths. <laughs> This brings us up to number eight. So in this instance now, we're gonna expand upon the triadic arpeggios we played earlier. We're gonna add the seventh degree. So the trick to this, of course, is in connecting them together. You don't necessarily always wanna go from the root to the root. So these thirds and seventh connections can be a good way in as well, because the threes and sevens are very closely connected. So for number eight, we're gonna play seventh arpeggios. <laughs> Whilst we're moving through these ideas quite quickly, it's worthwhile bearing in mind that in between each take, what I'm actually doing is playing through the entire duration of the backing track. So for each one, I'm looking at it for four minutes. Now, of course, in practice, in isolation, if these ideas are new, if they're new to you, then you'd stick with any one. So for example, if we're looking at something like thirds and sevens, you can really slow it down, break it down outside of the tune, so in this instance, I want to know what the chord sequence is. It starts on A minor, so what are my options in these middle two strings? Well, that's the third and seventh, or more accurately, the seventh and the third of an A minor. There's an A minor seven chord. That's the seventh degree, that's the third. My other options are to play the third and seventh. So they're the options. The next chord is G minor. So that could go to here, or I could go to C7, C7 is, is this, that's what happens, it goes G minor, C7. Now if you're not aware of that, those connections, then it's a good idea to break it down, take it away from trying to put it into a tune. You're not ready to put it into a tune yet, if you're not entirely uh, 
secure with the third and seventh voicings, then you need to take it outside of the piece before you can then plug it into real music. This is something that you can do once you've amassed those skills. So it's a way of kind of drilling things you can already uh, do, but putting them into a musical context. So with this in mind, so far everything that we've done has been quite exercise based really. Uh, number nine and 10 are gonna be more of a musical kind of a freer thing, shall we say. So for number nine, I'm gonna play through the entire tune and I'm just gonna try and play really melodically, outlining the chord changes, not necessarily with any particular rhyme and reason, but I'm not gonna uh, attempt to play anything fast or tricky, it's just gonna play melodic ideas. So number nine is to play through the tune, but stating melodies, like as if you're rewriting a new melody for the piece, that kind of thing. <laughs> strategy I'm going to adopt for number 10 is to play some bebop type lines through some of the 251 moves. So in this instance we're going to play some slightly faster ideas, hopefully once again outlining the changes as we go. So that's 10 of 10. Let's just take a moment to recap those 10 approaches that we've just used against this tune. So the first was to outline the melody. So we can use this on any tune, of course, any piece. It doesn't need to be this particular example, it could be anything. So make certain that you can play the melody relatively cleanly, you know, uh, as straight as possible, just to make certain that you've got the melody correct. Okay. The second thing to do is to then play the melody with embellishments, or fills in between with it octaves you know you can kind of play some variations you know whatever you uh, whatever you can imagine at any given time okay so then the third thing that we did was to play a bass line so make certain that you understand what the bass is doing as well as knowing what the uh, the melody is doing if you know what the bass line is doing then uh, you're going to have a good understanding of the harmony it's a good way of imagining the harmony by by kind of singing a bass line in your head then i think if i'm not mistaken the next one we did was to play uh, the blues. We played some very, very simple blues type ideas through the whole tune. So in this instance, uh, you could play the minor pentatonic through the whole thing. Uh, that w may not necessarily work in every tune, but certainly works here. Okay. Then I think, if I'm not mistaken, the next thing to do is we use triads. So to outline the whole progression using triads. Now, each and every one of these approaches could form the basis of an entire practice session. In this instance, because I've kind of already got these things together, you can uh, group them together and cover more than one approach in one go. But if you're still at the stage where you're not entirely sure of the melody, then I wouldn't even move any further than stage one. You know, that, this could be over 10 days even. Okay, so number five was triads. Number six, was to expand that to seventh arpeggios, so to uh, to expand the harmony. In fact, I think if I'm not mistaken, I did thirds and sevenths first. So thirds and sevenths maybe in number six. Then I looked at the actual chords themselves. That would be the seventh approach. This can go in any order. But I'm sure you uh, you get the idea. That we can move them around. Then seventh arpeggios was number eight, uh, or could just be arpeggios. They could be ninths, whatever you know, whatever you want them to be really. Number 10 was to play, sorry, number nine, forgive me, was to play really melodically through the changes, try and create a new melody, uh, but not necessarily relying upon any kind of chops type things, not necessarily quite fast or, or any kind of technique orientated thing. And then number 10 is just take the brakes off, you know, do, do whatever. In this instance, I chose to play some bebop type phrasing, which is more kind of uh, 16th note type lines. So in this instance, it was the faster type stuff. Now, of course, it could be 10 completely different things. It could be chord melody, it could be using intervals. You could, if you don't have the restrictions of the backing track, you could put it in a different time signature. You could move it to a new key. You could do 
anything really. It's all basically um, whatever you can imagine, whatever kind of creative restrictions that you can think of. Because that's what they are, you know, me saying I'm gonna play through this whole tune just using the pentatonic scale is a restriction. But by using that restriction, it opens up the possibilities to kind of, uh, to being able to find new sounds, to be able to really explore each idea in its entirety. Whereas if I open up to everything immediately, then sometimes that can be overwhelming. Now, of course, when you play, that's what we do. You know, to a certain extent, we allow the subconscious to kind of, uh, to govern you know, which idea we're gonna use at any given time. But in practice, the more specific you are, often the more work that you'll get done, the more productive work that you'll get done. So I hope this makes sense. Of course, you know, these 10 approaches are not at the exclusion of any others. They're just because in the moment I needed to make a decision. And that's basically what I practiced for these things yesterday. And I've also practiced them once again today. It's what I'll do for the next tune that I'm gonna play. Although maybe I might pick 10 different tasks that would be more appropriate based upon whatever the challenges are of that given tune. So I had a great question from John relating to walking bass lines, this kind of stuff. So where we have two parts happening at the same time. So what we're going to do, we're going to break down a really simple 12 bar blues in the key of B flat. And in this instance, we're going to use this as an opportunity to not only consider the bass line, we're also going to consider the voice leading of the thirds and sevenths in these higher voicings. Uh, the principal challenges here are to maintain a good feel for both parts. Ideally, we want the bass line to be legato, whilst the accompanying chords, we want them to be more staccato. For the purposes of this example, I'm going to use a very, very specific set of chord voicings here. Uh, so the concept is going to be all of the chords for this particular 12 bar blues are going to be based upon a tritone on strings three and four. So I'm going to keep this really simple. Now, of course, we can expand upon this. We can go uh, in lots of different directions, but just so that we've got a very specific thing to work towards here today, that's what I'd like you to do on the middle strings is maintain this tritone. So tritone being six semitones, three tones, bisects the octave right in the middle. So the thing about the tritone is it's symmetrical. We can never really know in this instance whether that's the seventh of the chord and that's the third, or whether that's the third and that's the seventh. And that's something that we can use to our advantage when creating voice leading between chords. So by that, what I mean is, okay, here's a B flat seven. Okay, our first chord in our B flat blues. Now the next chord in the B flat blues is an E flat seven. And what happens in this instance is the function of the notes flips over. So here, that's the seven on the D string, and that's the third on the G string. When we go to our E flat seven chord, it's still third and seven, but they flipped over. So whereas previously that was the seventh, that's now become the third, and that's become the seventh. And you notice that they just moved by a semitone. So in its most simple form is the one, four, five. One, four, one, five. Just by moving one fret. B flat, B flat, B flat, B flat. And that can be used as a helpful way to connect them together when you're creating bass lines by just sidestepping with semitones. first opening bars of our 12 bar blues. Now I'm using a really kind of unusual finger in here and this might not be one that you, you'll uh, be familiar with or you maybe use just when you're playing regular chords but it's helpful in terms of maintaining that third and seventh in the middle strings. So the fingering that I'm using is when the roots on the E string the bass notes being played with the first finger okay and the seventh is being played with the second and the third finger is not doing anything at all and the little finger plays the third. So, 
And the reason for that, why I'm using that fingering, is so that when I go to an A string root, there's B flat seven. When I go through an A string root for the E flat seven, and then switch between the first finger and the third finger, and in this case I move down a semitone. So in a way, if I stay on B flat here, as I go on B flat, E seven, B flat, E seven, and that's the principle of triton substitution, actually, because I can go from B flat via E to E seven to A. So here I could comp and go. So close to a walking bass line. Just with these very, very small three note chords. So let me just simplify that again. We've got B flat seven, B flat seven, E flat seven, B flat seven. Now I'm gonna go F seven, B flat seven, and I'm in bar five. E flat seven, and I could go to A flat there. A. Now I'm gonna sidestep down, B flat, A, A flat, G seven, C seven, F seven, and the turn around. So that can be our complete 12 bar blues. Let me play that one more time. Bar one, two, three, four, bar one, bar two, bar three, four, bar five, six if you like, seven. Line at the moment, that's just connecting these chords. So here's just the third and seventh. See how connected that is? Okay, so now if I connect that together with the bass. Walking at the moment. Let me just clarify there I broke from the finger and I didn't have to do that. I could have done that for C7. So maintaining this one, two, four finger in. So F7. Baseline, I could break from the fingering and do up that kind of thing. But for this particular example, I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to sidestep. So what I'm going to do when I've got four beats on a chord, I'm going to go. The first three beats relate to the chord that I'm on. Okay, so if I'm B flat. My bass line is now going to go B flat. Then I'm going to either go up or down a semitone to go one, two, three, or one, two, three, whichever I feel like. Okay, then on B4, I'm going to use an introduction to the next chord, in this case by going from whatever the tritone would be. So that's B4. Now that doesn't relate to B flat now. B4 is more about where we're going to. So the first three beats of a bass line, if it's four, uh, four beats for each chord, generally pertain to the event that you're on. The preceding note before a chord change generally relates to where we're going. So this is going to be like B flat stuff, B flat stuff, then something relating to E flat. So we're going to go, in this case, uh, F, B flat, or Making 
sense. Okay, so let me play that really slow. So if you get the fingerings right, these transitions, really, it's just going between the first finger and the third finger. Going from one chord to the next should be relatively simple. So what I'm doing here is I'm going from the chord, either a semitone above or below, and then before it relates to the next chord. Now. And the rhythms that I'm playing are a combination of either just one, three, four, one, or things like one and. One and one, two and that kind of thing. In fact, for this one, let's maybe stick to the same rhythm all the way through. I'm just going to go one and. Six two five. There's one six two five. And these are the kind of things Joe Pass would embellish with. By putting other notes on the B string. But for now, our, our core, if you like, or the kind of self fingerings is B flat, G seven, C seven, F seven. So let me take this through super slow. So in that instance, I was just playing this one and at the start of each bar. Of course, you can do this more freely. So I'll take a similar kind of tempo. I'm going to put the stabs in in a more free way. a little bit quicker. Here's one final variation for this week based around the playing of Joe Pass. So if we take that turn around at the end, which previously we played this as B flat, G7, C7, F7, like so. And we're going to take this part, the 3 7, 7 3, and we're going to add a note on the B string. So in this instance, it's the 13. Okay, and I'm going to keep it in the same location. So as if I'm going to just move the same exact shape up three frets. Although I'm going to have to change the finger in, in this instance because I want to play a G bass note here. So what happens is the first and second fingers flip around. The first finger goes onto the D string and the second finger goes onto the A string now as opposed to where it was before where we had the second finger was on the D and the first finger was on the E. So they flip around. So if I stay in the same position, it's like going between a B flat seven and an E. 
7 sharp 9. Although, we'll go to G7, then C, 13, F7 sharp 9. So the idea being here is that the treble moves in, uh, in parallel. goes transitional uh, options that are available to you. But let's just play a little simple one. We're just going to go boom. That's a nice one. Hope you enjoyed this week it's a pleasure to put it together so thanks once again for the great questions for the lovely comments that i've received and also for uh, the requests uh, so feel free to shout out if there's any area that you'd like me to take a look at i'll certainly share my opinion and hopefully give you some ideas some fresh ideas even if it's a topic that you're familiar with sometimes revisiting things is a good way to get new uh, new material new vocabulary and so on so as it's a new year, it's a good time to kind of uh, evaluate your playing. So one thing that I'm going to suggest to you as a good thing to do with it being the first week of the new year is record yourself playing the things that you play best, the way that you play in the style that you think really kind of typifies what you do as a player. Uh, the reason for this is when we get to this time next year, I'm going to uh, suggest you do the same thing once again and compare the two. Very often one of the things that you'll find with uh, music as an art form is because what we do disappears into the air once we've done it. Uh, sometimes we feel like we're not progressing. We feel like we're not actually making progress. We feel like we're not changing or evolving as a player. But then occasionally you listen back to something that you uh, maybe played a, a while ago and it's unrecognizable from the player that you sound uh, as of today. You know, so I find recording myself, it's another one of the reasons for doing these things, is... Uh, is it's a great way to gauge your progress. The other thing that I do, which I've spoken about many times, is anytime I uh, uncover a new idea or you know, find something you know, from another player or just something that, for whatever reason, just falls out of the guitar fortuitously, I make certain that I record it and I stick it in my voice notes. And then when I sync that to my computer, it goes into a file. And that file's got several hundred very small files within it. So anytime I'm stuck for inspiration, I can just delve into that uh, folder and find some uh, half-finished idea that I can develop. And also it serves as a good way to remind myself of the progress that I've made in the previous months or the previous years. So as it's a new year, I'd suggest you find some way to document where your playing's at as of today so that you can revisit that in time and you can kind of gauge your progress uh, you can see where, where you're going as a player. Sometimes you can even remind yourself of really cool things that you used to play that, you, that for one reason or another you've moved away from. You know, I often find that when I listen to old recordings. I think, why, do I, why have I stopped doing that thing? That was really cool. And it's a good way to bring stuff back into the act, as it were. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed, uh, you've enjoyed today. As always, take care of yourself, stay safe, and I'll see you next week for number 34.